extremist militia, some of them with links to Al-Qaeda. These militia had allegedly left their bases, but continue to haunt the streets. We tried to get access to one of these bases, saw a handful of gunmen there, and were told to leave. A pickup truck just swerved in front of us, forcing us to stop. Three men got out and wanted to talk, I'm assuming, about what it is that we're doing here. And they seemed quite agitated. One of our escorts was warned that, quote, since the extremists no longer control security, they couldn't ensure ours. They were advising us to leave town. In the market, most eyed us warily. Residents say a general strike and demonstrations forced the militias to abandon their bases. But this man tells us it's far from clear they will fade away. While we were filming here, a man came over to speak to us, but he was too afraid to go on camera. He wanted us to know that the majority of people here are sick and tired of being in the spotlight because the minority, he says, is affiliated with al-Qaeda. Hussein Masoudi, a local journalist, says radical Islam has always had a place in Darna. Men from here fought in Afghanistan, and estimates are that more than 50 traveled to Iraq to become suicide bombers, the highest number from any town outside of Iraq. The city and its surroundings were sympathetic to these groups because they had a common enemy, which was Gaddafi, Masoudi explains. They were all trying to bring down Gaddafi. From the onset of the revolution, it was the extremists that provided security. After liberation was announced, says Masoudi, there was increasing pressure on al-Qaeda in Yemen and other places. Coming to Libya was easy. Among those setting up camp, Sufyan bin Gumu, once bin Laden's driver and held in Guantanamo Bay for five years, established the Ansar al-Sharia unit in Darna. <laughs> and Abd al-Basit Azuz, alleged to have been sent here by al-Qaeda's leader Ayman al-Zawahiri. According to security sources, these Islamist militia have a common goal, weakening and then infiltrating Libya's security apparatus. In Benghazi, there have been more than a dozen assassinations of former military officers. Sources tell CNN that many of them were reportedly on an Islamist hit list to eliminate qualified individuals that could pose a threat. <laughs> Colonel Hamid Belkhair of the Libyan army was recently kidnapped. He says he doesn't know by whom or exactly why. He got a call from a man who spoke as if he knew him and said he had urgent information to pass on. Outside his home, in broad daylight, two masked men forced him into their car. When I got into the car, they put a black hood on my head and began saying things like, you're going to see, threatening me, he tells us. Later, he says, he was forced to his knees and told to repent and renew his faith in He thought he was going to die when the phone rang. I could hear someone say, he's alive, we haven't killed him yet. You can hear his voice, he recalls. And then he was free. The influence of these radical groups has emerged in the capital. Last month, they destroyed Sufi shrines, including this one, right in the heart of Tripoli, a move typical of Salafist intolerance of other branches of Islam. As the shrine was being demolished, eyewitnesses say that Libyan security forces facilitated the act by blocking off the street. The Ministry of Interior says that it's investigating these charges, while also acknowledging that it cannot go after these groups, claiming it wants to avoid shedding Libyan blood. And that is the problem. The government's currently not strong enough to face down these groups, and they always thrive amid weakness. Arwa Damon, CNN, Tripoli.